we today find ourselves in Philippians chapter 2, and we are working our way, looking at verses 5 through 7. Jesus in human flesh. Why? Do you know why Jesus was in human flesh? And we're going to be focusing in on that. So if you've been with us, we have learned the book of Philippians is about joy. Jesus, then others, then you. And we're going to keep repeating that, that the joy of life is when Jesus is first, (laughs) others are before you, and you put yourself last as a servant of all. We uh, saw this in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, when it talks about walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, he's talking about keeping the unity of the believers. In Philippians 1, 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So whether I'm there or not, let your life be the same. Don't pick it up and start showing a diligence when I'm there or an obedience because I'm in town. Let it genuinely come from a motivation much deeper than that, that you really are doing what you're doing for the glory of God. There there is no greater motive There's no greater place in maturity as a believer. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I not doing what I'm not doing? It's because I understand I'm made in God's image. And Jesus Christ came into human flesh, died and rose again, that I could live the way Jesus would live if he were in my body, walking in the same way he would walk. We also discovered that we come to be united um, when we begin to do what Jesus would do, have the same mind. In Philippians 2, verse 1 and 2, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection of mercy, fulfill my joy being like-minded, like-minded with Paul the Apostle, but also like-minded with Jesus Christ. And Paul says, you follow my example, you are following Jesus' example. What a mighty man of God he was. So like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. And then he also said that they unify in thinking about others before themselves. In Philippians 2, verse 3 through 4, where we ended last time we were together, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. We would use the word humbleness, having a humble heart. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not out only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So Paul, in these following scriptures, is going to teach us about the key element of unity, which is learning who Jesus is and then being like Jesus. So we start today in verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Boy, there's some really great modern translations that sometimes really bring out um, what you're trying to understand. And in the New Living Translation, it says this, your attitude should be the same that Jesus Christ had. So simple, but yet so exact from what this verse is saying. So there is our goal, to be like-minded with Christ. Think the same thoughts, the same views, be in harmony with. So imagine you are being the greatest light, you are being the most powerful salt of the earth when you are walking like Jesus. And he is in essence saying here, link up with that mind. Robinson in his commentary says this, keep on thinking this in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it says that mind in Christ Jesus, remember in in verse 2, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, the same word there, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, the same word there. So three times, be like-minded, be of Christ's mind, be like-minded with Paul. 
And, um, and so which mind are we to be unified in harmony with? Christ's mind. Paul tells them just which mind that is, Christ. They have the same mind as Jesus. Jesus is an example of us demonstrating the things that make for unity. The quality of a humility. Think about it. Was Jesus thinking about himself when he came to earth? Was Jesus dying on the cross because it benefited him some? Everything he did was putting, thinking about us as even more important than himself. And doing all that he did for us. And he did it uh, even unto the cross. We're going to look at next week the glorious reality that happens when we walk as Jesus walks and, and please the Father, we'll be looking at next week. So the basic mind is Jesus's mind and to have that same mind as him. We can do it. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, we have the mind of Christ. When you're born again and God's spirit comes into you, he circumcises your heart. That old dead sin nature goes and now our, the lights are turned on. Bing, bing, bing. A spiritual mindedness we now can have. And also in 1 John 4, 17, because as he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father with all power and glory and majesty, so are we in this world. It's radical. That it's in us in the same way it was in Christ because we are born again. We're a new creation in Christ. So that verse starts out, let us. And you know what? We can. It just comes back to your willingness to look at everybody as more important than yourself. To see everybody's interest as more important than your interest. Are you, are you willing to do that? You know, I've been meditating on this week, and, and I have to say, it really has caused me to live differently. I'm actually looking for situations where I can put others first, where I can actually see their interest more important than my interest whether it's in the store or whether it's in my attitude when I'm inconvenienced, to say, hey, let me put you first. And you know why? Because we're going to come next week and see that the Father desires Jesus to be glorified above every name because he did that. He came into human flesh and he did exactly that. Well, what else did Jesus do in verse 6? Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now you look at this translation and, and you realize this is very complicated. I, I, I don't really know what to make heads or tails. Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Why, why is it saying it that way? Well, very simply, guys. You can't really use English words in this situation and understand the original Greek. There are very few times this happens in the New Testament or in the Old Testament Hebrews. But there are a few times where when you read an English sentence, you're just going, that, that, I, I don't understand it. When you go to the original language, and it's easy to do now, right? <laughs> Uh, just there's so many helps like the blue letter Bible and stuff that you just click it and it gives you every Greek word and you just click on it and define it for you that it then becomes understandable. This is the word morphe. You know, we, we, we have that where people can morph into something other. But it really doesn't have that understanding. The, the understanding of this is an outward display of an inward reality. So in other words, Jesus in heaven, exactly how the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is, whether it's in relation with the Father or the relationship with the Holy Spirit, or whether it's him and his love, his kindness, his mercy, his hatred for self-righteousness, 
his hatred for religion, when he came into human flesh, he was that exact form, that exact nature, but in human flesh. This is what it's saying. So remember, Philip said, well, okay, well, show us God, and that'll suffice. Show us the Father. And, and what did Jesus say in John 14? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember in John 10, I and the Father are one. So the substance of God, let's use that word again, very inact words, is one. The Lord our God is one Lord. We have one God, one substance. But yet God reveals to us that he is in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They do certain things together like creation or Jesus' resurrection. They were together in all of that. But then there's things they do individually that the others don't do. Jesus came in human flesh, <laughs> the second person of the Trinity. But yet when we saw him, we saw the exact form, the exact image of God. Listen to this. Lacking nothing. That's why it's important. So when he says here, um, in this verse, being in the form, being, this word being, it's, it's really the, the word that would translate to begin or to make a beginning. It's in the present active participle, which means to begin existing and then to continue existing in this way. Guys, here's a mind-blowing thing that we actually learn in the book of Hebrews. That when Jesus humbled himself and came as a man, that was for eternity. Because he rose again from the dead in that earthly body that was of the earth and now turned into the heavenly. I'm not going to go into that, but it's all in 1 Corinthians 15. So now he's back in a heavenly form, so to speak. But yet, he says, look, Thomas, at the scars in my hand. Look at the scar in my side. It's me, guys. Touch me. And the Bible makes it clear, and we're going to look at this, as Jesus raised from the dead, we will raise from the dead in the same way. And so Jesus, at a point in time, was God in heaven with all the glory, all the majesty, everything was revealed. Seraphim and seraphim had to fly around constantly saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, or even heaven would explode. But now God came into human flesh at a moment in time. He was still God, but then he will continue that way. We says it this way. Thus, the Greek word for form refers to that outward expression which a person gives in his innermost nature. Weiss explains that the ancient Greek word translated form is very difficult to translate. When we use the word form, we think of a shape or something. But the ancient Greek word had none of that idea. It is more the idea of a mode or an essence. The essential nature of God without implying a physical shape or image. So we're thinking form. We're thinking human form. That's not the point here. When it says that being in the form of God, there really is no form in shape, right? It says in John 14 that God is spirit and those who worship him. So it's really talking about God's essence, all of God's substance, all of God's nature. This is what he's saying. Jesus being in that form, even though he was in human flesh. And then the next phrase, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This is, again, really interesting. The word robbery in the Greek is to, in the act of seizing, the thing seized or to be seized. We have the word harpazo, which we're familiar with, the snatching away. Uh, there it talks about the rapture, how we're snatched away. Harpazo. Uh, it comes from that root, to be seized by force. 
Weis defines this ancient Greek word robbery as a treasure to be clutched and retained at all hazards. So Jesus didn't feel that he needed to seize his godness in case he might lose it. Jesus didn't feel that he had to, had to worry and be concerned about his godness. He simply was God. And that would never change and never be questioned. So Jesus came into human flesh. He was veiled. And the very nature of God never changed in him. It, it never was something he had to grab onto going, well, I may be washing your feet, but I'm still God. <laughs> I'm down on the cross, but you guys need to know that I'm still glorious. Angels worship me and, and, you know, I'm God. He didn't have to, he wasn't insecure. He wasn't worried about losing that. He wasn't worried about people not seeing that or understanding that. His equality with the Father is a fact that is unchangeable. It is not something he needs to seek to acquire or seek to grab onto and, and still and hold on to it. Jesus is God. These two things are clear. Number one, Jesus is God. He does not need to protect it. He does not need any further explanation. There is no beginning or end with Jesus. It tells this in John 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So, again, this, this understanding the triunity of God's important. The Son was with the Father. All things were created through the Son. There was nothing created that the Son wasn't a part of. And He's at the beginning with God, as if there is a beginning with God. But for our, it's an anthropomorphical statement to help us try to understand. There is no beginning with God. But there is a beginning of God coming into human flesh, which we shall now know for all of eternity. Do we get this? It's important. And the Bible's going to tell us why this is important. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And then the very next few verses in John 1, 14 now, the word became flesh. When I, when I read that, I think angels in heaven start singing and dancing and hitting the drums and the cymbals. Because it is a moment in time that even all of the earth creates our dating system around that moment. It's the year 2022, because 2022 years ago, Jesus was born. Doesn't matter where you go on this planet, doesn't matter what religion you are, doesn't matter what your politics are, doesn't matter if you're an atheist or not. You will write down the day that Jesus Christ was born. That's astounding. These are things that are incontroversial. When the Iron Curtain fell and we went over to the preach the gospel, and I would be in the streets and they would say, well, how, how can you believe in God? They were raised in communist Russia under the Soviet Union. And, and, and we would say, well, you, you know why the dating system? Oh, yeah, we know why. It's Jesus Christ. <laughs> they knew it. And I'm like, you know what? I didn't find one person in the Eastern Bloc that didn't know the answer to that question. But I rarely find anybody in America who knows the answer to that question, which is interesting. But in John 1.14 again, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of it. So God in heaven, he's full of grace. He's full of truth. He's full of love and kindness and goodness and purity and hope and joy and peace. And so much more. It's sort of infinite, isn't it? But the boy he hates too. God hates self-righteousness. 
God hates religiosity. That's what Satan creates. Satan creates religion. He loves religion. When he finally takes over the earth, that's the number one thing he's going to do is try to create a worldwide religion that worships a pin. <laughs> he loves religious people. They're mean. They make everybody feel guilty. And they make everybody feel like they've got to be slapped to stay in line. It's void of relationship. Jesus wouldn't put on the robes of a rabbi. He wouldn't go to their universities to get educated. Repeatedly, the religious people were mad at him over little tiny things of keeping the law, which weren't in the Bible. It's, they made it up. They had made it up just a couple hundred years earlier. It was never done by any Jew before that. But now these Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin, they all are creating this new religion, which really is a cult. And when Jesus came as the nature of God, it, it, they, they were repulsed by Jesus. Wow. The stone that the builders rejected was the chief cornerstone. The very first stone you put in place to build the building, all angles are to be measured off of that stone. It wasn't even there. How did they build it? They built it as suited them, the best the way they eyed it. And then they realized at the end, oh, this chief cornerstone now won't fit. <laughs> it now can't work. The most important stone no longer has a place in this temple. This is why, again, Christianity constantly sticks out in the world when we're talking about real Christianity. We're talking about a Christianity of not of laws, not of rules, not of rituals. Our body likes that. <laughs> Our body wants the giant building with the stained glass because it makes us feel in awe when we look at the ar architectural beauty of it. We, we want a cold, echoey building. Our flesh loves that. Our flesh loves that you do it all up on stage. I can put my brain in neutral and not even know what you're saying. It doesn't matter because this is all I got to do is sit here. It's painful, but it's only going to last an hour. <laughs> and I'm done. It's not something that has to be lived in relationship moment by moment, day by day. What Jesus created, all the religions of the world can't mimic. Christianity sticks out like a sore thumb amongst all the religions of the world. It's awesome. Jesus came. Jeremiah says, don't let the rich man glory in his riches, the wise man in his wisdom, or the mighty man in his strength, but glory in this, that you understand and know me. And in this, I delight. So Jesus came at a moment in time that changed the way God would operate throughout eternity. The God who was in spirit, the second person of the Trinity now became in human flesh. And he raised again, as all human flesh will raise again from the dead to those who are believers and born again. John writes, the little children, I don't know what we're going to be like, but I know that when we see him, we'll be what? Just like him. Repeated through the New Testament, Jesus was the firstborn from the dead or the first fruits raised from the dead. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, clearly, exactly how Christ raised from the dead is how we will rise from the dead. And we shall be in a body just like his. And we will have a nature like his. We'll always be humans. He'll always be God. There's the big difference. But we are now going to be able to be exactly righteous as Jesus is righteous. That sounds like heresy. He gave it to us as a gift, right? He who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be.
from the very righteousness of God. So we and Jesus, our brother, for all eternity, it tells us in Hebrews, are going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. And we'll see him. Scars in his hand, scars on his brow, scars on his side. And the way they saw him on earth, after the resurrection, he still looked the same. Look at me. Touch my hand. It's me. Interesting stuff. But we see here, first of all, Jesus is God. It never changed. It never was diminished. The equality of Jesus in heaven as God, that same essence, that same form, that same reality is in Jesus' body. And the fact that he's the eternal God, but he's willing to let go of that place in heaven and come in human flesh veiled. In verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taken on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. This, again, this word reputation, what it meant when they originally translated it in the old King James and the word reputation today really are two different words. The word that should be here, and all commentaries that I read said this very same thing, only the New American Translation translated it this way. But it's the word emptied. He emptied himself, taken on the form of a bondservant, being in the likeness of men. He made himself of no reputation, or he emptied himself. Dave Guzik says this in his commentary, from ancient Greek word emptied came the idea that Jesus' incarnation, that's Jesus in flesh, was essentially self-emptying. So Jesus emptied himself. What did Christ empty himself of? Not, not of the divine nature, that's impossible. He always continued being the son of God. It's, it would be impossible for him to become less than God. But Christ gave up his glory and added humanity to his nature. He took upon himself limitation of space, of knowledge, of power, of majesty, this is so important because when he took on this form of humanity, it wasn't a king, it was a servant. There was no human glory to it. He was in Nazareth, he was a poor carpenter. <laughs> Where was Nazareth? It was the worst town in Israel. It was the last town you would want to be from. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was the saying. And his origins of who his dad was were questionable. And they were known all the way in Jerusalem when they inferred that he was a bastard, <laughs> that his father Joseph was not his father, which was true. Jesus came into human flesh, and the godness of him was veiled completely. So there was never a sense of, wow, he's the great king. Wow, he's God. Wow, he's the creator of the world. Wow, he's, he has all powerful and all knowing. It never happened that way. Jesus was so completely veiled as man and as the lowliest of men that he could do the work that he came for to be the servant of all men. This is why it's so important. And again here, when it says he took the form of a bondservant, it literally is saying in addition to, not in exchange, that in heaven he was a servant. <laughs> he was a servant's heart. You understand, guys, this is so important. That when we die and, or we're raptured and we go to be with the Lord, we don't walk over to Jesus going, hey, good to meet you. I'm sure, I'm sure I'm looking forward to get to know you better, Jesus. No. We already know him. If you've studied the scriptures, if you looked at him in the gospels, if you've listened to a deeper doctrine through the apostles, like today, this is hard stuff, guys. You guys are hanging in there. You're so great. This is hard stuff, isn't it? I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry that we've got to put our thinking. I should have told you that front. <laughs> this is one of the best, most important passages, but it's also a very difficult passage. So sorry, but see, that's my gift, taking the hard things as, as difficult as they are and making them enjoyable. That's how brilliant I am. But uh, <laughs> kidding, kidding. I'm waiting for it, Brian. Go ahead. I'm waiting for it. Anyway, we know him. When we get to heaven, we know him. And you know, when I get to heaven to see Jesus, I don't think we're going to see this celestial robe that flows and a thousand angels have to carry his train behind him and, and he glows and sparkly. I think when we see Jesus, he's going to be in overalls looking like a farmer. <laughs> and we're going to be at complete rest in his presence. Interesting. That Jesus being a servant wasn't something he started doing. He's always done it. Now coming into human flesh, he wasn't the king. He didn't have the best voice. He wasn't a famous author. He wasn't a great athlete. He wasn't... He stood out for nothing except being the lowliest of the lowliest of servants. Remember Isaiah 53? Man esteemed him not. He looked as if he were smitten of God and afflicted. Jesus lived a life that looked like, man, I'm glad I'm not him. <laughs> Everything about his life was difficult. If it wasn't humanly so, Satan made it so. We know he went through an extra difficult life, so he was tempted in all ways we are. He experienced grief in every way a man can experience grief, so he can aid us once he's back at the right hand of the Father. So I really want you to see Jesus in flesh, but I want you to understand what it means. He didn't start becoming a servant. He always eternally has had the heart to be the servant of all men. And in heaven... You know what he's going to be? The servant of all. That's who he is. And so when he came into human flesh, how should I come? I'm going to come like me. <laughs> the father says to the son, what, what, what are you going to look like? I'm going to look just like me. Well, what does that mean? The lowliest of servants. That's me. That's his nature. So in addition to making it clear who he was, Important note, Jesus did not empty himself of his deity or of any attributes or of his equality of God, but he did veil it. So the conclusion on this is Jesus was previously continuously existing in the form of God, but now he took on the form of a servant, a man in addition to being God. And so coming in the likeness of of men. What's this mean? Lighten it. it actually means an exact replica. It would, it would be like this. And, and this is important. He's not a phantom like the Gnostics say. But he, he came into the human body and he was made or became at a moment in time the point in time, it's an aorist pass again, participle. And Jesus always God for eternity, but has a definite point in time. In the past, he became man and was continually remained so. He did not come in an outward form of deity, which could have continued to remain, remind us that he was God. But as a man, he was veiled in his deity to truly be humble and true servant with no position or power. So he didn't have little glory moments, so he reminded everybody, I'm serving you, but you really should be serving me because I'm God. He never did that. He, he never tried to sparkle. Now, there was a couple of moments where his deity shone through that he couldn't, he couldn't control that. It wasn't up to him. Do, do you remember the Mount of Config, uh, Transfiguration? When all the glory was there and he shined his clothes whiter than any white on earth, his face glowed with the glory. Also in the Garden of Gethsemane, hey, we're looking at this Jesus guy. Jesus steps forward and says, 
I am. And what happened? They all fell to the ground as dead men. So th there are moments that even completely being veiled, that the nature of his love, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness, his self-control, his patience, his grace, his mercy, was powerful. Do we get that? Now, I, I, hate, I hate to use these two examples because neither one were the Christian example that I would want to use today. But Mother Teresa, she focused in on being the servant of all and of touching the lowliest of the lowliest people with cancer and leprosy and babies with AIDS. The guy one time said to her, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to do that. She said, you couldn't pay me a million dollars either. There's not enough money on earth to motivate me to do this. But yet this lowly woman who was in the backwoods of India, the whole world knows about her. Another one was Gandhi. Again, <laughs> I don't believe he was a Christian. But he had the attributes, that, a lot of the attributes that all Christians should have. And his lowliness and his meekness and his kindness, it made the entire world stand up. And it turned a nation completely over. It's, it's sad that in Christianity we don't have such a figure. Maybe Billy Graham. But understand, if we could grab a hold of God for the, what he grabbed a hold of us for, your kindness would be powerful. Your gentleness, your mercy, your purity, your holiness, your love. It would explode. And this is what we see with Jesus. There are moments in time where him being God in human flesh changed the whole world. You know, Jesus from Israel, Israel, a tiny little country. It was at the time of Christ. It's not as big as Abraham was promised, not yet. That'll happen in the millennial reign, but it was a tiny little country. Nazareth was a tiny little city <laughs> in a tiny little country. And Jesus was the poorest of the poor, a fix-it man's son. He never traveled more than 90 miles from where he was born. He never wrote a top 10 song. He never wrote great poetry. He wasn't the strongest man. He didn't have the best voice. He wasn't a philosopher. But yet, Jesus and every single sociologist, Christian or not, will tell you that Jesus' Judeo-Christian ethic has exploded to the four corners of the world. And there's nowhere today you can go on this planet that the name of Jesus isn't known. And a concept of Jesus, unfortunately many it's wrong. But imagine if nobody read the Bible, but we had the same mind as Christ. What would happen? There's moments that churches have got a hold of it. Our Jesus movement, it got a hold of it, didn't it? Chuck Smith was like Jesus. He really did. He embraced these hippies, smelly, unbathed, barefooted, stringy looking guys on drugs and messed up. And he, he embraced them when other churches were repelled by them. He accepted their music when other churches said it was demonic for him to do so. He had drums on stage. No! They're demon-possessed because they have drums on stage. But he, he kept his eyes. And I remember asking him to one time, tell me, tell me what it was at the very heart at the beginning. He goes, it's easy. It was just Jesus. We thought about Jesus. We loved Jesus. We breathed Jesus. We were like Jesus and we loved Jesus. We liked him. We wanted to be like him. 
And, and the bottom line is everybody felt loved. We just felt so deeply healed by Jesus' love. And it was everybody was walking in that love. And it was healing to all of us. And people would come from all over the world just to come to the tent or come to hear Chuck teach because they were just loved. This is a powerful, powerful passage. Jesus coming in human flesh. In 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, no question about this, no discussion, great is the mystery of godliness. It, 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 it is mind-boggling, hard for the human mind to fathom it. God was what? Manifested in flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. We believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. How can this be? It's a mystery. Well, what if it doesn't make sense to me? It's still true. In the last verse we're going to concentrate on next week as we finish all the way up to verse 11 next week. But it says, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Not only did he come as a servant of all men, but he came as the Lamb of God, <laughs> as a literal blood sacrifice. I want to end here in a few minutes. We're not going to be able to look through all of this, but it's there for your reading. Why is it important that Jesus came in human body or human flesh or flesh and blood? Number one, to die as our substitute. The wages of sin is what? So all men are going to find out when they leave this body, they're going to be looking at a bill collector. <laughs> and they're going to have to say, you got to pay up. Well, I don't know how much money. You don't need money. It's eternal death, eternal separation from God. That's why Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experienced that. Jesus died and came to that bill collector. Not just for one person's sins, for all people's sins. You know how many bills Jesus had collected in human flesh? <laughs> Zero. He was without sin. He paid the bill of you and you and you and me, everybody. Jesus paid everybody's bill. And our sins can be forgiven because he could die in our place. Stay with me through Hebrews. I picked a difficult passage because I want you to understand the depths of this. But as I read this, look at the word body. Look at the word flesh. Look at the word blood. In Hebrews 10 verse 5, therefore when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a what? Body you prepared for me. Jesus is talking to the Father here. And he's talking about how outrageous it was, how powerful it was, how noble it was, how amazing it was, how necessary it was, how surreal it was. Just think about it for a minute. Jesus came as a baby. His brain <laughs> was a baby's brain for a while. Angels were around about keeping him. But then he was a three-year-old and a five-year-old and a 10-year-old. The Bible doesn't talk a lot about this. But again, all of this was known by Christ. All of this was asked of by the Father. And Jesus joyfully said, I'll go and poop my diaper. I'll go and say goo goo gaga. I'll go into human flesh and stumble around until I learn how to walk. I, I, I can't explain how humiliating that must have been in a sense. For Jesus to think of how humiliating that is. But then to come into a flesh that was screaming to be impure, screaming to get high, screaming to be angry, screaming to be greedy, screaming to find my body to feel good and not bad. It's, it's just outrageous that God is mindful of us. And God knows every hair upon our head. And Jesus in human flesh said, 
the sacrificial system of the Jewish of the Jews is not pleasing to you. What's going on in Jerusalem and the priests and the it's not pleasing to you anymore. But yet, me in earth, in this body, to be the Lamb of God, this is pleasing. But what a holy, powerful ah moment that was when Jesus presented himself as a lamb dumb for his shears. Who are you looking for? I am. They fall down as dead men. They get up and they bind him up as a lamb was dumb, said not a word. So he said not a word. They beat him. They plucked his beard out. They whipped him. They made fun of him. They put a robe on him and and said, okay, king, which one of us slapped you? And then in Hebrews 10, verse 6 and 7, he burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins. You have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I come. And the volume of the book, it's written of me to do your will, O God. Do you think Jesus might have quoted that in the desert when he was being tempted? Here's his body, weak, thirsty, hungry, becoming emaciated in that hot, lowest spot on the planet Earth. Literally, blazing hot, uncomfortable, Satan comes, and at the end of it, he just says, in the volumes of the book, it's written of me. Over 350 prophecies about Jesus' first coming. Alone, volume is an understatement. And in Hebrews 10.10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the what? body of Jesus Christ once for all, verse 12 of Hebrews 10. But this, what? Man. After he offered one sacrifice for the sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Different now. The last time he was at the right hand of the Father, he was spirit. Now he sits down at the right hand of the Father with scars in his hands and upon his brow and in his side. A resurrected human body. Now he sits down upon the throne next to his father. Note in Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. Hebrews 10.14. For by one offering he has perfected. How long? Forever. Those who are being sanctified. Verse 17 and 18 of Hebrews 10. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will what? Do I get an amen for that? Our lawless deeds will be remembered no more. I don't think anybody can hear better news than that. When I witness to people, often I'll say, do you believe in forgiveness? Yeah. If you wrong somebody, do you believe you need to be forgiven? Yeah. Do you ask for forgiveness? Yeah. Do you feel forgiven? No. <laughs> I feel like even after I said it and humbled myself and made recompense, I still feel guilty. I said, because the greatest sin you committed is never against man. It's against God. You sinned against him first because you're made in his image. And the forgiveness you're longing for is not from man. It's from God. You need the ultimate. So sinners walking around getting forgiveness from one another is never (laughs) going to fill the void. It's like cotton candy. (laughs) The the, the real forgiveness they're craving is from God in that that broken relationship through their sin. Their sins have separated them from God. In Hebrews 10, 17 to 18, then he adds their sins and their lost deeds will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these There is no longer an offering for sin. So once you're forgiven, there's no more need for a sacrifice. There's no need for more forgiveness. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us. Through the veil. That is what? His flesh. Remember when Jesus said it is finished? What happened first? The veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And they were looking into the Holy of Holies and only the high priest was to look in one time a year. Jesus' flesh 
was veiling God, wasn't it? His flesh was veiling. If, if I were to take off my flesh right now and you could see my spirit, you would see Brian Newberry's spirit that was made in 1960. If Jesus were to open up his flesh and you looked upon his spirit, you would have been vaporized. Because no man can look upon God and live. But the moment he said, it is finished. Forever in all eternity, no more veil, no more separation. You can now come into the holy of holies every second of every day. You can live in there if you want. <laughs> because of the blood of of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the fle- the bo- Jesus had to come in body to fulfill all righteousness. In Romans 10, verse 19 to 21, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Adam, he did a powerful thing. It affected all of earth. Jesus did a more powerful thing. It affected all people on earth for all eternity. Verse 20 of Romans 5, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death through Adam, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That whole chapter 5 I had in here, I had to keep chopping it down, chopping it down, chopping it down. I actually had 16 pages of notes last night. (laughs) Last night, I mean... I have so many verses under each of these, and I just sort of have to stop, huh? And then he had to come in human flesh to represent and intercede for us before God. We know that. Listen to 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, and look at it a different way than you have in the past. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. What? The man. Christ Jesus. I've had people ask, why does it say man there? Guys. Jesus has risen from the dead at the right hand of the Father as what? Man. Glorified man. He's God. We're going to be glorified men, but we'll be men. I'm a human in an earthly suit. When I resurrect, I'll be a human in a heavenly suit. (laughs) Jesus was God in human flesh on earth. Jesus now is in a heavenly resurrected body, God. It never changed. God never changed. The God thing never changed. It just went for the first time in all of history, a beginning when he was in human body. And now in his human body, resurrected human body at the right hand of the Father. So let's read it again. There is one meteor, there is one God and one meteor between God and men, the what? Man Christ Jesus, who, this man, gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. So many verses I had to just cut out of this, but you know the verse where Jesus, it says that Jesus now, he's raised from the dead. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is up there smiling and looking at you. Mercy. And this is what it says. Jesus knows what it's like to be in our human bodies, doesn't he? He's there in his human body looking at the scars sitting in the human flesh that he used to have an earthly flesh like that on earth, but now he's got this heavenly human flesh in heaven. And he remembers. In Hebrews 2, verse 14 to 18, I, wrote, I got this in the New Living Translation. I just love the way it emphasizes the humanity of Christ here. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood. Jesus also became flesh and blood by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die. Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he deliver those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We all know that Jesus came to help the descendants of Abraham, not to, help the, not to help the angels. Therefore, it was necessary for Jesus to be in every aspect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest before God. He then could offer sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people, 
Since he himself has gone through the suffering and the temptation, he is able to help us when we are being tempted. Jesus emptied himself and took on the human flesh. He knows we're going through because he's been through it too. And of course, we know that, don't we? And uh, the, the advantage we have with Jesus being our great high priest. Who is he in heaven? Our king. Who is he? The high priest. Who is he? The son of God. Who is he? Our friend. Who is he? Our fellow human brother. <laughs> Who is he? He's the lamb of God. I love that. I can't, can't every, probably once a week I read Revelation 4 and 5 and they're looking on Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And then a couple verses later, they're looking on Jesus as though he were a lamb that had been slain. I'm looking at a lion. I'm looking at a lamb that looks like he just died. And that's what we see upon the throne. Therefore, Hebrews 14, we know that we have a great high priest who sympathizes with us in all our weaknesses, who is all point tempted as we are without sin. Therefore, come what? Boldly into that throne of grace. Get mercy and grace for our time of need. And finally, because Christ raised from the dead, we shall also be raised from the dead. These are verses I looked at early in Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He is the firstborn. He was first resurrected. His human body, when they went in the tomb, it was what? It was gone. Just the clothing was left. That's why a lot of people say, when you rapture, our clothes will be left behind. Could be. I don't know. Piles of clothes everywhere. Could be. Of course, we live in Southern California. There's piles of clothes everywhere already <laughs> for different reasons, though. In 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. Well, guys, this was a tough couple of verses. I hope I didn't make it tougher. I hope it's like, this is easy. I heard other guys teach this. It was easy. I, Brian, you made it hard. I hope that's not the case. But I really did want to leave you with a moment today that would change your life. That you would look at Jesus differently. That you would know that song of praise in Revelation 4 and 5. You alone are worthy to open the scroll. Because you came into human flesh. You died for our sins. You rose again. And now you can take the scroll, the scroll of the ownership of earth, and open it. And then they sang, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Oh, Jesus, thank you for this day. Lord, we want to understand what it is that we now in human flesh, we can walk as you walk. That although we're in a sinful body and a sinful world and our flesh has sinned so many times, we're addicted to it. We're so comforted by it. We love to sin. But yet, we now have the Spirit of God in us. That we could walk with you now like we are going to in heaven. That we can walk as an image of God as you created us. You can heal us and restore us. By your stripes we are healed. You've been bruised for our transgressions. The chastisement of our well-being fell upon you that we can now resurrect from the dead even now, just as Christ raised from the dead, that we in our mortal bodies could raise again even while on this earth to a new man, to no longer walking after the flesh, but walking in the spirit bringing great peace to ourselves and great joy to others and great worship to our King of Kings. Lord, nothing more can be said. There's so much lacking in this. Such a great subject. But Lord, stir our hearts and our minds to meditate upon these things and to worship you. <laughs> Jesus, the second person of the Trinity who came into human flesh forever changed, that you might redeem us. 
Mm, in Jesus' precious name. Thank you.